This morning by the Nebraska Corn Board and Corn Growers. I am Kelly Brownforst. I serve as the executive director. First, this morning I want to extend a thanks for everyone for joining us on this important topic of trade. We don't have to go back far to remember the discussion that originated from both of our presidential candidates while campaigning. Then President Obama was finalizing negotiations and working to present the Trans-Pacific Tar Partnership, or TPP, to Congress. At the same time, then candidates Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were taking positions against the multilateral free trade agreement. Fast forward to today, and President Trump has been sworn in and within his first 100 days has withdrawn from TPP and talked publicly about renegotiating NAFTA. What does this all mean for Nebraska's corn and agriculture industry? Today, we will hear from two perspectives. First, from a Washington, D.C. perspective, is John Hyatt. John serves as the Executive Vice President for the National Corn Growers Association, leads our efforts in Washington, D.C. Following remarks from John, we will hear from Tom Slate. Tom is a President and CEO of the U.S. Grains Council, who will present an international perspective. The U.S. Grains Council is a cooperator in the National, sorry, Nebraska Corn Board, and works to open markets around the world for corn and corn products. This is similar to other cooperators such as U.S. Meat Export Federation and U.S. Poultry and Egg Export Council. In our agenda, both John and Tom will provide remarks for about 15 to 20 minutes each. Then we will open it up to questions. Respecting your time this morning, we will attempt to keep the webinar to one hour. Following John and Tom's comments, we'll open it up for questions as I mentioned. You may either click the green ask a question button under the presenter photo box for a voice question, or you may type your question in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. John, thanks for coming on this morning, and uh, we'll turn it over to you. Please proceed with your comments. John, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah, we could just barely hear you, John. Can you hear me now? That sounds great. All right. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you for being on the call this morning. Uh, as a bit of an aside um, uh, on the trade front, we've had some rumors. Uh, well, we've had a lot of rumors uh, since the election about uh, meetings with uh, uh, President Trump uh, on the, the issue of trade. I just sent a note out to uh, the board and to the uh, market access action team and the state execs saying that we've heard another flurry of, of rumors uh, over the last um, 18 hours about potential meeting with ag leaders and President Trump on trade. Uh, we are following that up, but you know, this is Washington, DC. Uh, we do well with rumor mongering here. And so when you see those things, know that we are following up on them. But at this point, we, we are unaware of, uh, of anything just yet. But we have been working with all the, the other ag organizations uh, to try to get this meeting put together. Uh, we hope it happens sooner than later, but we are working on it, but nothing definitive as of yet. So, uh, again, uh, Washington is a, a great place for rumors. Uh, there is, uh, as of this morning, a rumor of snow, uh, perhaps even, uh, you know, a tenth of an inch. And so everyone is going to the grocery store to pick up bread and toilet paper. And because it's Friday, they probably will be going to the liquor store as well. Uh, to make sure that they can live through the weekend uh, and the, the snow, snowstorm of uh, a tenth of an inch. So anyway, moving right along, um, trade update. Where are we? All right, I'm not getting. Okay, um, there's a new sheriff in town, and certainly uh, Donald Trump uh, ran as a Republican with a different approach to trade, and since he has been uh, elected and then uh, sworn into office, his uh, promises have been, been pretty close to what he said on the campaign trail. Uh, one of the first acts he, he did when he was inaugurated was 
He withdrew the U.S. from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, uh, a 15-nation trade agreement that was very, very close to being completed. Uh, it was awaiting action by the U.S. Congress uh, for the last year or so. Uh, the Congress decided not to take it up uh, last year, even though uh, all of the agriculture groups in D.C. pushed to get a vote up. But um, that's a moot point now. Instead, we are going to move to bilateral trade agreements. Uh, those bilateral trade agreements, um, the negotiations for those can start once we have a full complement of folks at USTR and USDA and at Commerce. So even once we get started, you're still looking at three to six years to get each of those done. Uh, and we have some resistance from some of those nations about moving forward on bilaterals. Some nations would prefer to um, go with the, the multilateral approach. Uh, I think probably Japan would be at the top of that list. We are also looking, uh, this new administration is looking at, at discussing existing trade agreements uh, with Mexico, China, and Japan. Uh, particularly, our concern is with Mexico mainly. Uh, Mexico is our, our largest uh, customer for corn, and um, the, the Trump administration is very, very much uh, in favor of renegotiating the NAFTA agreement, which is with uh, Canada and uh, Mexico. Uh, Wilbur Ross uh, was just confirmed last week as the Secretary of Commerce. He has indicated to the through presses that uh, his first job is to start renegotiating NAFTA. Uh, Robert Lighthizer uh, is named, is, has been nominated as being the uh, trade ambassador uh, he's an old Dole uh, Ag and Trade guy. He's been around for a long time, should be really good on this. Uh, but he has some hangups with, uh, given the fact that he had uh, a foreign government or foreign entities as, as uh, consulting clients in the past. He's going to have to get a waiver from the Congress in order to be confirmed. We'll have to see how that uh, delays things. And then we have Sonny Perdue, who has been nominated uh, to be the USDA uh, Ag Secretary. Uh, he should be a slam dunk, but there has been a holdup on his paperwork, uh, getting it to the White House, and then uh, there is a delay at the White House with his paperwork. Uh, we have been in constant contact with uh, the Senate Ag Committee, encouraging them to move as quickly as they possibly can once that paperwork is sent up to the Senate Ag Committee. Uh, we have assurances that they will move as quickly as possible. I don't see that there's going to be a problem with getting him confirmed at all. Uh, Tom Vilsack, uh, the last USDA secretary, has endorsed uh, Sonny Perdue. So I think we're probably uh, going to, that would be something that will happen fairly quickly when it starts. Um, I think probably most of you on the, the call know these numbers, but Mexico, Canada, Japan, and China are your top four export markets. Uh, I know that you export a lot of corn. Uh, I've been out for your what, corn days, or I've, it's been a few years since I've been, been yeah, harvest, yeah. And uh, but I know that you have a, a lot of interest in, in your corn uh, going to Mexico. Uh, you also export a lot of uh, ethanol, uh, over a quarter of a billion dollars worth of ethanol exported from, from Nebraska, uh, 400 plus, million dollars in DDGs, uh, and then the, just the, the jobs that are created by the grain trade in, in Nebraska are really important, and those are the kinds of things that we emphasize with the administration, who is, you know, this administration is all about jobs, saving jobs and creating jobs, and that nearly 3,600 jobs uh, created in the grain trade are, are very important to your state and very important to the, to the nation. So we want what we want to do and what we've emphasized uh, with folks in, in the administration is let's have a constructive dialogue. Let's have a, a productive relationship. Uh, let's try to avoid some of the name calling and uh, attempt to uh, work on the existing, to, to enhance the existing relationships we have and to build, build new ones. Um, one of the things that, that we are concerned about is that there are uh, a number of Republicans who in the past have been very strong supporters of, of uh, trade agreements and international trade. A lot of them are sitting on, on the sidelines and the, the Main Street Republicans, those, uh, you know, your, your more establishment type Republicans, uh, have pretty much been 
absent uh, in this discussion and pushing on trade. And we are pushing them to get back into the fray and, and to advocate for uh, the existing trade agreements we have and, and to, uh, to build new ones. Uh, we would think that Senator Sass has been very, very good on this issue. Uh, he has been a consistent voice of reason uh, and a strong voice for trade uh, in the past, and he certainly started this game uh, this last year. Uh, but he certainly needs some help, and we would hope that you would contact uh, uh, Senator Fisher and then your three congressmen uh, to make sure that they know that uh, this is very, very important to Nebraska agriculture, particularly Nebraska corn. Um, what we're asking you is just to set, encourage folks, let's play well with others. Uh, let's let's um, tone down the rhetoric and try to, to make these uh, relationships work better. Uh, we want to make sure that corn continues to have duty-free access in Mexico and in Canada, and that's really important. One of the things that we have emphasized, and, and I mentioned it in, at Commodity Classic, and that is you need to talk to the Hill, but you also need to talk to your fellow farmers. Um, you know, we still have a lot of folks out in the countryside who still question uh, how effective NAFTA has been. I think if you look at the numbers, well, I know if you look at the numbers, uh, you, it wouldn't take much convincing to understand the importance and the positive benefits of, of NAFTA. So if you're at the coffee shop or if you're at the parts counter uh, or after church on Sunday, um, engage with your fellow growers and, and remind them of the importance of trade uh, because we need to build an echo chamber here where it isn't just the leadership within our organization, but the, the grassroots members have a good understanding and a, an appreciation of and uh, feeling a, an ownership in uh, the, the trade agenda that we've been pushing for some time. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Slate. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, hope everybody can hear me. Uh, hang on, we're just shifting uh, microphone here. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Tom Slate uh, with the U.S. Grains Council. And we're going to talk, um, Kelly asked me to talk a little bit more about the uh, international reaction to what's been going on lately. I'm going to focus on that, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the big picture issues on trade, and uh, maybe that will spark some questions as well. This is a slide that, that is on the screen right now that I hope a lot of you have seen uh, and seen numerous times. It shows about you know, the, the underpinnings of trade, and that's the fact that the global middle class uh, has been rising uh, rather aggressively, particularly in emerging marketplaces. And you can see in the green the growth of the global middle class in developing markets versus developed countries. And you know, the, again, we're in the midst, you know, and of this upswing of demand growth driven by developing countries rising standard of living. A very, to put it very simply, we we want our customers to be doing well economically. If they do well economically, they'll buy more. From us, and it's you know, we like to see that wealth is spread around, uh, particularly uh, in developing countries. Look at it another way in terms of the markets we've been talking about is showing you how middle class incomes uh, and emerging markets are going to grow over, over the next uh, several years. By 2024, you can see this uh, enormous growth in China and India, where, you know, where, where you're focused uh, quite well through your you know investments in the Grains Council, you know, through your checkoffs, you know, and, and the FMB market access program funds. We can talk about that some other time. But again, if you look at China and India, the growth in, in um, markets there and households, uh, you know, reaching the middle class, as well as if you look down this list, every one of these is a key market for you right now. Egypt, a very strong expanding market for you right now. Uh, Mexico, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, the top growing feed market in the world right now. You can see this growth, but again, the, the staggering numbers are in China and India. Here, just another picture. Uh, we've shown this several times. Just again, the importance of trade. John talked about this, talking about the importance of trade to your neighbors. Well, in this, you know, you can see there are more people living inside the circle on the screen than live outside of it. 
you know, 97, 95.7% of the world's population lives outside the borders of the United States. You as farmers, you want to have access to, to global markets and, and trade because that's where a lot of people are, are growing right now. So what is this council focusing on right now? This is another graph I think maybe many of you have seen that we've been using for quite some time to help guide our thinking on trade. And this is uh, exports of grain in all forms, you know, taking into consideration uh, commodity exports as well as meat, uh, ethanol, uh, processed you know, products like starch and so forth. And you can see here, uh, we did have, came off a really good year in 2015 to 2016 where we had total in grain exports of all forms, including meat, uh, almost 4 billion bushels of, of U.S. feed grains were exported. Were exported uh, and that's up 300,000 metric tons over last year, uh, and it's the second highest year on record. Unprocessed, you know, commodity grain, you know, just, just regular grain, uh, accounted for 16% of production. But if you put it, the grain equivalents uh, of all this together, including value-added products, we're up to almost 30% of production is being exported right now. And that's that's a pretty key market for you folks. And we're, we see this as rising over the next several years, getting up to somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 billion bushels uh, by 25, 26. And again, that takes into account uh, exports of ethanol and, and uh, DDGs and meat and everything. Again, you, you have very good folks working for you to meet Export Federation, U.S. Poultry and Egg Export Federation uh, Council. And so you that really is working well for you in terms of positioning on trade. This is a quick slide on ethanol. This is our, our where we Council, as you know, has been involved in ethanol exports. Uh, I keep saying it's been going better and faster than I thought it was going to. And again, it's, this is our goal of where, how we see ethanol exports uh, increasing over the next uh, 10 years or so. But one of the key things that I always like to remind people, you talk about the rise in, in food production needed to feed, to feed the world. Well, the rise in protein production is even more, more stunning in, in terms of meat, uh, milk, and eggs. Yeah, we see a 60% increase in the, in the amount of meat, milk, and eggs required uh, to feed, again, these expanding you know, middle-class populations around the world. This is a number I think is going to be a key driver in the years to come. Just talking about the value of trade, I just want to read this from the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, set out recently when this debate was really firing up pretty hot and heavy during the election. A U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, for both parties, turning away from trade is not just a threat to the economy and millions of American livelihoods. It's a threat to our national security as well. Trade is how we lead in a dangerous and uncertain global environment. Trade leadership helps us in negotiate agreements that strengthen ties with global partners while protecting the interests of our citizens. Expanding trade is key to, to making our country and people more prosperous and more secure. Let's build bridges and not walls. Uh, again, it's sort of the, the, the essential uh, underpinning of trade is what a principle called collective intelligence, that the flow of goods, ideas, and capital and people is essential for prosperity, something that's only been started since the, you know, the caveman, really. Here's a quick example of this in terms of how, you know, with the extent of trade over the last several years, you've seen a very significant drop in global poverty. And again, poverty, you know, curing poverty while we still got a ways to go, it creates greater security, uh, less threats, and, and happier folks around the world. And that's the underpinnings of trade. That's why it's important. Here's a quick slide that shows you, uh, you know, values of free trade agreements. This sh it shows, uh, you know, the five years prior to the trade agreement versus the five years after the trade agreement were put in place. Again, we put NAFTA over here separately because it's, it's, the, the scale is so much larger. But you can see uh, time after time, you know, in terms of uh, uh, CAFTA, in terms of you know, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, the South Korean one, the Colombia one, it's special. Uh, it's been, you know, this, this is a particularly uh, vigorous growth there. And China, that, that, that is when China, after China acceded to the WTO. And again, a lot of this number here is driven by, by soybean exports in particular. But you can see the value of U.S. Ex exports, uh, you know, rising after free trade agreements are put in place. So they are working. Uh, this is another graph you just need to stare at for a while. 
It shows you uh, the, the growth of agricultural export trades and various intersections of, of key elements uh, of, uh, of trade policy. For instance, the GATT, you know, you see this nice pickup with the GATT, um, you know, Japan beef and citrus coming in, NAFTA coming in, you see this rise, uh, China coming into the tail, you see it beginning to, to go up, uh, you know, capped in the, in the DR um, in Central America, and then the Korea, Colombia, and Panama free trade agreements, you see this direct uh, rise in the value of agricultural exports with, again, several key elements of, of trade agreements and trade uh, occurrences. So, again, we're getting after the value of trade in terms of what it does for your business. And, again, you need to put this in context about where the U.S. is compared to other countries in terms of trade agreements. The yellow shows the total world trade agreements, and that little sliver of blue down there at the bottom talks about U.S. how many U.S. agreements are in place. So. We've got some catching up to do, and I think that's uh, we all know that, and so we we are all dedicated to that, and so let's get after it. Okay, now now to what you know, I uh, want to talk a lot more seriously today as our current uh, dilemmas. Uh, particularly, we'll start with NAFTA, and John introduced this earlier in terms of the people that are in place. Uh, this is uh, Robert Lighthizer here on the uh, on the far left. In the middle is Peter Navarro, and on the far right is uh, Wilbur. Um, our, our commerce, he mills our commerce of uh, tr uh, Secretary of Commerce. The point that we want to make sure you understand why you need to engage and engage fully and, and robustly is that most of these folks have a, have a background in what we call trade le remedy lawyers. Uh, you, you as farmers are into uh, an element or a mode of trade expansion. Trade remedy lawyers are, are it's, a, it's a terminology that goes to, they've helped, um, you know, distressed companies, you know, good best example is that steel or industries, I should say, steels protecting those, those companies from foreign competition. That's what a trade remedy lawyer is called. And, you know, Robert Lighthizer, while he's a very experienced name, we do think he's going to be good at USTR. This is his main, you know, this is his main area of expertise, trade remedies. Trade expansion, we need to be talking more about them, and actually we have and people have, and he understands that, but he, you know, that's, that's, the, that's part of the problem. Uh, Peter Navarro, you may have heard that name. He's an, a trade advisor. This is not someone who's, who has to be approved by Congress at all. He's a trade advisor. Uh, he's an academic. Uh, he's, he's a professor from the University of California, Irvine. Um, you know, not necessarily one who's been out there in the trenches, uh, you know, creating trade deals and or, uh, you know, having litigation or solving trade, uh, trade, trade problems. So that's a bit of a concern that, that again, the, the, the understanding of the impact of trade expansion, particularly for someone like agriculture, needs to be expanded with him. And more or less, some, some of the same concerns for Secretary of Commerce Mills. Um, Right now, with, 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 with NAFTA, the major problem is uh, the administration needs to notify Congress of a 90-day uh, uh, period of intent to reopen or, you know, reopen NAFTA. Um, I think they're, they're tawing around with the idea of doing that uh, now or next week, but I think that that idea may be uh, being scuttled a little bit, and the talk right now is perhaps later in 2017 we actually might get serious about reopening up NAFTA. So watch this 90-day notice period as you as you go forward. There's three major U.S. issues now with NAFTA that, that, that do not really affect agriculture, but these are the ones that other industries are really uh, going after the administration about. One is the, um, you know, you know, there's a rule of origin issue with cars made outside the United States that, uh, outside of NAFTA, I should say, that 60% of the uh, parts within Cars need to be made within um, NAFTA countries. Uh, I don't think that rule has been necessarily strictly enforced, uh, but you see, uh, you know, unions and so forth want to see that rule increase, that percentage increased uh, beyond 60%. Again, so more auto parts are made in NAFTA countries. This is a key part of the NAFTA, NAFTA uh, angst, I would say. Uh, chapter 19, you may hear more about. It's uh, this is a chapter within NAFTA where Canada and Mexico can challenge 
trade revenue solutions that we've talked about before in terms of um, you know the experiences of uh, you know you know uh, ambassador soon to be ambassador Lighthizer's work in uh, the steel industry. Uh, you know, Mexico and Canada can challenge these trade remedy solutions, and that's something that I think that the administration is interested in softening up. And then, of course, you're probably familiar or have heard about the issue uh, where trucks, uh, Mexican trucks, are now allowed to come in the United States uh, delivering produce, and that's something uh, the Teamsters are very much interested in having renegotiated. So those are three major U.S. issues that you're going to hear a lot more about in terms of NAFTA. Mexico, uh, from the staff that work for you down in Mexico City, um, we've been talking to them, you know, almost every day. Uh, and uh, basically the reaction from the Mexican side uh, from uh, our director down there is the customers are saying, why are you doing this to us? You know, why are you calling us names? We're your good customers. Um, we've had frosty, what I call them, relationships with customers that, you know, these customers that we've developed over generations not just the, you know, over the past several years, over generations. Many of you have heard about this bill that was introduced by Senator Armando Rios Peter. Uh, I actually read this bill. It's, it's, it's one of the most, uh, it's a very stem winder type of bill. It goes all over the place, all over the you know, Mexican culture and the Mexican economy and uh, you know, accusing the country of Donald Trump is the way he calls it, uh, of doing all these nasty things to Mexico. A lot of rhetoric, not a whole lot of substance in this bill, but the rhetoric that our staff in, in Mexico is really getting concerned about. You know, people, customers, your customers, your good customers are angry. They don't like it, and they, they, don't, they don't like hearing this. Uh, and, you know, Mexico is starting to react to this. Um, just uh, on March 1st, they, reop they opened up a unilateral uh, tariff rate quota. Uh, you know, this is, again, for beef and rice coming in tariff-free, 200,000 tons of beef, 150,000 tons of rice. There you go. We're starting to lose sales already. Uh, it's not, not something that's being threatened. It's, it's happening already, albeit at a very small level right now. But, you know, this could, this could uh, expand. Sagarpa, which is basically the Ministry of Agriculture in Mexico, has already prepared a Plan B as telling telling industries to prepare a plan B. Uh, here's the, this is a quote from the Secretary of Agriculture in Mexico saying this, given the uncertainty with NAFTA, we cannot idly sit, sit idly by to see what happens. We have to seek new alternatives so that our buyers, importers of corn, soy, or other products like meat have options to import from elsewhere in the world. Mexico cannot be without suppliers without selling its products. We recognize that there is a great dependence. That's why we're going to do tours to search potential new markets, unquote. This is, this, again, the Secretary of Agriculture in Mexico going out and saying we need to diversify our supplies and we need to diversify our markets. Uh, that, again, they're very concerned from a food security point of view that Mexico can't really afford to be uh, such a good and strong partner with the United States in terms of trade and agricultural products. So you're going to you're going to see a lot more about that. And a lot of people ask, well, what can Mexico do in retaliation to all this? And I think maybe some of you have heard about um, you know the threat to uh, you know with all these returning um, Mexican illegal uh, workers that uh, Mexico may force the U.S. to prove. Uh, that these uh, people are you know, Mexican citizens uh, before they let them back, back in. And that could really be sticky and gummy and, and really unpleasant for all of us. If, you know, all of a sudden a lot of these people are caught up in uh, limbo land. So that's, that's Mexico. Japan, um, you know, is a slightly different case. Uh, but still similar themes. Uh, obviously, many of you know that Japan was a major focus for TPP, particularly for meat and uh, you know, pork and beef and meat products. Uh, and there was a lot to be gained from that. Um, there were many domestic policy changes that were enacted within Japan to prepare for TPP. And a lot of these were, you know, quite uh, honestly, very, very strong protectionist uh, measures in Japan. Again, your, your uh, director there in, in Tokyo, uh, Tommy Hamamoto, uh, has been following this, tracking this, you know, again, on a daily, hourly basis. Um, 
talking about uh, Prime Minister Abe, that's his picture there in, in the corner. Uh, this is a, a cover actually in a magazine where he was sort of, you know, Superman, Super Abe, trying to over, you know, re renew the Japanese economy and, and, and bring it into the modern world. Um, he was the first head of state to come visit President Trump. And the initial reaction in Japan to a possible bilateral free trade agreement with the United States was not all that positive. Now it's softened a little bit and they're talking things like a bilateral economic dialogue. That's not necessarily a free trade agreement. And there is news out yesterday, I'm sure some of you may have seen this, that Japan is interested in talking about trade with, uh, with the US, but they wanna leave out agriculture. And this is something that you know, we have continuously fought over the years is that once you start leaving agriculture out of any free trade agreement uh, this discussion, that is a huge mistake, a huge problem for U.S. agriculture and a huge mistake. So you've got to watch those things very, very closely. Um, China, uh, well, you know, we've got a lot going on with China. And uh, I've always said our trade relationship is not at a peak right now. I think the thing to watch for now in terms of what we hear from uh, your staff in China is, you know, watch the interactions between two particularly important uh, Chinese citizens. One is President Xi over on the far right, uh, and the other is Jack Ma. Jack Ma, you may or may not know, he is the founder of Alibaba, the world's largest online retailer. And, uh, you know, actually Jack Ma was one of the, uh, the Chinese, one of the first Chinese citizens uh, President Trump actually had a meeting with or, or talked to early on after he was inaugurated. Um, so again, it sort of shows the, you know, President Trump's business orientation, but uh, the relationship with China and President Xi is gonna be extremely important. You know, some of you may have, may have heard about the one belt, one road uh, philosophy of China. This is following along the Silk Belt and the Silk Road uh, you know, policies way back in, in, uh, in China, you know, um, it is a policy where China has said, you know, we're basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, uh, generalizing immensely here, but we're the, new, we're the new sheriff in town when it comes to international trade. China and its, in its, in its outwardly looking uh, engagements of the world is going to be the stronger player and leader of the, of the global, uh, world global economy and world global trade. And the one belt, one road uh, philosophy is very, very sharply in contrast to, uh, you know, the U.S.'s views on trade and something you've got to watch carefully. We've got a lot going on with China right now uh, in terms of uh, WTO cases. We can go into that if you want. Um, there's a lot of talk about the U.S. having a self-remedy, like imposing tariffs on Chinese products. Uh, that might happen. Um, we might pile on, you know, just go after them with all, all our uh, ammunition that we have, or it might be something else. Um, right now, for you uh, as corn producers, that you've got to realize there's just absolutely no movement on biotech issues. Uh, there are several varieties that are events that are still hung up right now, and it, it, our estimation right now is you're going to see nothing approved in 2017 because. There is a Communist Party Congress later in the year, and they don't want to have any, any kind of policy changes ahead of that uh, party Congress. The bottom line with China is that we must get this relationship right. It's important to you as corn producers. I know a lot of you produce soybeans. It's important to you from as a soybean producer. It's important to you as uh, in terms of meat exports. Uh, this is a relationship we have to get right. Uh, China is our largest international customer for agriculture overall. And it's something we just have to straighten out and, and figure out and pay a lot of attention to. Uh, we lost a very prominent uh, Nebraskan here a few days ago. I'm sure many of you who, if not all of you, know Clayton Yider. Uh, he has a great uh, summary uh, you know, quote here that I just want to read. Uh, we all have a lot of respect for Clayton and, and how he views trade. And he said recently we have a lot of trade agreements in the world. We ought to honor them all. And when we start talking about tearing them up, that's just nonsense, if that were to really to happen. I worry about the carnage that would start to affect my kids and my great-grandkids. I'm appalled at all this loose language that is being thrown around today. 
Um, you know, we couldn't agree with uh, with Clayton more. Uh, it's very troubling to see this this uh, discussion on trade, and uh, I think again to echo what John said, it's a really good idea to talk about this in your communities, talk about this with your representatives. Um, for you as trade expansion uh, advocates, um, you need to be uh, looking at this very, very seriously. And uh, and uh, Kelly, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. Uh, our simple moniker is Kelly. We'll uh, stop there, and we can have at it. Okay, appreciate it, Tom and 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 John. Greatly appreciate your comments. This is a reminder. Um, if you would like a question, there's a couple ways you can do so. You can click the green "Ask a Question" button under the presenter photo box for a voice question, or you can type your question in in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I don't see any right away, so just a question for you, um, either Tom or John. We heard uh, at the end of the Obama administration moving forward with a couple of WTO cases, specifically one with China in regards to their internal corn support programs. What role does WTO play currently within trade? And secondarily, as we continue to look forward, what role will WTO continue to play in regards to trade? Okay, well, uh, I'll take that. This is Tom. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, well, that's another thing I didn't touch on. It's a very important point to bring out is that uh, the WTO is yet another area where the Trump administration has a lot of questions. The WTO is, you know, a very complex organization. We all know that. Very ponderous, uh, you know, organization. Things don't move very fast with the WTO. However, the WTO forms the foundation for trade in terms of trade rules. And it's very important for you all to recognize that, that there's a lot of different uh, trade spats over the years that have been solved and solved through WTO rules. Just recently, the, the, the anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases launched by China against the United States, the thing that, that helped us keep that under control as best as possible were WTO, WTO rules, and WTO offers us, the industry, the DDG industry, an opportunity to actually challenge China on those on their decisions. So it's important for us. And yes, there's a lot of improvements that can be made. But right now, as you mentioned very well, Kelly, there are two pending WTO uh, cases against China. One is, as you said, on domestic uh, price supports for, for corn, wheat, and rice. Um, this is, again, a huge contributor to the problem that we have with the DDG anti-dumping and a huge contributor to uh, you know, global trade distortion. The second is a tariff rate quota uh, administration. This is a much broader factor problem for wheat and rice that has basically kept though, those, those commodities out there because of the way China manages the allocations of tariff rate quotas between the government buyers and private buyers. In corn, it's, it's worked a little bit better, but it still needs reform. So you got those two cases going simultaneously. We have another case that we're working on through the WTO, and that is on value-added tax administration when it comes to DDGs. Again, we're getting a little bit into the weeds here, but you know it, this is something that is clearly uh, WTO illegal that China is doing, and we're trying to get uh, USTR, and I think they will uh, call, take China to task on this. Then you have to say nothing about a possible DDG challenge in the WTO. So the WTO is important to agriculture in terms of creating the foundation rules for trade. And uh, it's important that we have the WTO stays strong, sure, like anything else, it can be improved. Uh, but for you folks, uh, it's important because it helps determine the rules of trade. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we had a question come in at the bottom there from Tim. Uh, John, maybe this is a question for you to respond to. How do we as a group, or maybe even just as a grassroots too, effectively engage with the trade negotiators and administration outside of our cooperators? Okay, and that is a, that is a good question. Um, and uh, Tom and I are joined this morning by Leslie McNett, who is our new trade person on, on the NCGA side. And uh, uh, Leslie comes to us with a, a great deal of experience in in uh, trade issues, but you know what 
we have a variety of ways that, that we uh, work with the trade negotiators. Uh, you know, in, under previous administrations, we have met with the ag trade negotiators uh, on a pretty constant basis, as well as the uh, the head of USTR. Uh, in, in, and again, we, we need to have people in seats at USTR and, and at USDA and at Commerce uh, to meet with and to have uh, ongoing discussions about the importance of, of where uh, they're going with these negotiations. So it is a, uh, this is this is a town that's all about meeting people. And uh, as those positions get filled, we will be meeting with them on a constant basis, uh, providing information. Uh, I, I think the, the the most important thing that a lobbyist does is a lobbyist educates. And so our education uh, goals here would be to one, show the importance of, of trade to the corn industry and two, advocate for certain uh, directions that will continue to, to make our, our industry strong. Expand upon that a little bit, John, maybe you talk about you mentioned it briefly in regards to engaging with our congressional delegation, but what additional avenues can we undertake as a grassroots to engage on this issue? Who are some of the key people that we need to continue to engage with? I'd be, I would be talking to, I mean, your, your delegation is all Republican. Um, I would be asking for a meeting with the head of the Republican party in the state of Nebraska uh, and bring a half a dozen to a dozen to that meeting uh, across all commodities and uh, express the concerns that, that you all have and the importance of this uh, to the state of Nebraska. Uh, again, you know, we want to talk, we want to create echo chambers where that this, this message gets amplified over and over again uh, across a, a whole variety of different spaces. I was just going to add, this is Leslie, um, we remain in close communication with the career professionals at USDA and USTR who work on these issues. Um, and they are they are waiting for the new political appointees to come in as well because they'll take the majority of their policy cues from those folks. So um, we can at least be assured that there's not too much happening or changing in this interim period while they're waiting for political. Um, so they're kind of just keeping the buses and trains moving. Um, but again, I think sort of that influence from your congressional representatives uh, with the new administration will be really, really helpful. And it's a really important role for you to play. This is Tom. Let me let me just add to that. You know, we, we have a lot, again, as Leslie said, a lot of interaction with the, uh, the folks over at USDA and USTR and trade. Uh, there's nothing going on right now in terms of decision making on trade. So I think uh, a little bit of push to get these uh, these confirmations across the finish line is the first thing that, that you folks can do because without that direction, as, as Leslie alluded to, without that direction coming from their bosses, these folks are really frozen. They cannot comment on things. They can't put programs in place. They can't make any decisions whatsoever. So that's the first thing you can do. And like John said, I think the world belongs to those who show up, pay attention and talk to people about all of this. Thank you. Maybe another question that's being typed in right now and, and I'll proceed with a question maybe for uh, John. It was mentioned in regards to the potential for a 90 day notice coming before Congress at some point in time for President or his administration in regards to renegotiating NAFTA or opening it back up for, for discussions. And, you know, I think our initial reaction was serious concern on opening up any free trade agreement. But I think as we continue to hear, we realize that that agreement was negotiated 20 some years ago and put into effect. As we've come into today's marketplace, explain to us maybe the, the advantages of of some updates that need to happen and obviously some disadvantages of opening that back up for new renegotiation. Well, let me, I'm going to start and I'm going to turn it over to Tom, but you know, we, we have heard a lot of this, this issue around, well, NAFTA is 20 some years old, uh, shouldn't, isn't it time to go ahead and, and, and redo it? Well, um, 
I've been married for 31 years, and you know, if I went home and told my wife this evening that I wanted to renegotiate the marriage, it wouldn't work real well. So let, let's 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 go ahead and take what we have and and work to make it better, maybe than tearing it all up and hoping that we're going to get a better deal. Uh, it doesn't get much better than uh, having a very good, very close marketplace where you don't have any any duties imposed on your product. It, you know, unless they're going to pay us to uh, to export corn down there, I don't know how you make NAFTA better for the corn industry. So, um, yeah, there are other industries that have some things they would like to fix in NAFTA, but uh, I don't know if this is a perfect market, but it's pretty darn close. Yeah, yeah, John, you're right. This is Tom. You, you, we are pretty doggone close. The um, you have a good deal on, on grains for NAFTA. The one thing that I think that you have to recognize is that under TPP, you know, Canada and Mexico were part of TPP. There were elements of TPP that were negotiated, really, that, that covers whatever we want to fix in NAFTA. And that the only thing that I think that one of the top things I would say that you can fix in the, in the current NAFTA agreement is the biotech uh, chapter. You know, biotech uh, rules of the road. There's a rapid response uh, mechanism that was re uh, negotiated as part of TPP. Those are, are small tweaks we can put in there that are going to help you. But I, I agree with John. For, for you guys, uh, this is a good agreement, and we have an excellent customer. Well, both sides, Canada and Mexico. Canada will probably be your number two ethanol market this year, export-wise. And, um, you know, we just got to keep a good thing going. See, we have a question about why does it take um, uh, a long period of time to get bilateral agreements done, you know, anywhere from three to six or six to eight, seven. You know, in, just taking a look at the last dozen bilateral agreements that, that have uh, been negotiated and approved, none of them have happened within three years. And, you know, these, these trade negotiations are laborious. Um, you know, it, it, there is so much detail that needs to be worked out and negotiators get together. They, they, they try to find, uh, agreement on general terms. A lot of times they have to go back to their principles, uh, to, you know, at least one level, maybe two, maybe three levels above them to find out if they can, uh, uh commit to something. It's a lot of back and forth. It is extremely laborious to the point of being boring and once you get to that then you have a whole process by which uh, the agreements are agreed upon by the, the respective governments and in the, the case of the US uh, they have to be submitted to the Congress um, and I, I could say that you know the Congress doesn't move quickly on anything and they particularly don't move quickly on trade deals so uh, it, let's say we had a, a trade agreement uh, that the White House had signed off on. Uh, they sent it to the, the Congress. I think it takes 60 or 90 days for them to even start to, to take action on it. Then you have to have hearings. Um, you know, it takes a long, long time. Uh, you know, so from the time that the agreement is made with the White House to get it completed by the Congress, we've seen some of those take a year and a half to two years. Uh, the Panamanian uh, and South Korean and Colombian agreements, they took, what, two years? No, no I think it was like four, yeah. From from the time they were submitted yeah. to the Congress. Yeah. From the time the next administration, right. they were ratified. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, yeah, and, you know, John's absolutely right. And it goes back to that question that Tim raised. Um, the, 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 all these negotiating points have to go back to the respective industries for buy-in. And you've got a lot of different industries that are parts of these agreements. So you've got negotiating, going back and ch checking in with industries, making sure they're comfortable with the negotiating points, then going back again. It is a long process. Uh, and, and I've never used the word quick and trade policy in the same sentence. Appreciate that. If there's any further questions, please uh, type them in or raise your hand. Um, I'll just make a few closing comments and then we'll turn it back to John and Tom for a few closing comments in case there's any questions yet to come. Uh, I will just say that uh, in regards to meeting with our congressional delegation, uh, President uh, Dan Wesley of the Nebraska Corn Growers Association joined five other representatives from Nebraska Agricultural Associations at the 
uh, invite of Senator Sass to sit down when nominee or USTR nominee Lighthizer was coming through. That happened yesterday, and, and we look for a report from Dan as he uh, travels back. Long day for him, but it was a great opportunity to, again, as John and Tom both mentioned, reinforcing the opportunities and necessity for trade as we look at 95% of the U.S. population living outside the U.S. borders. John, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for some final comments. It looks like maybe there might be another question coming through, and, and then Tom, and then we'll take another question and, and then wrap up this morning's uh, session. Okay, well, thank you. And, and Dan was in our office yesterday, uh, right after the, the meeting out on the Hill, and he was uh, very encouraged. But, you know, those are, we need to, to uh, do as many of those as possible. Uh, not everyone can come to Washington, D.C., but you know, there's an awful lot of opportunities back home, uh, town hall meetings, listening sessions. Um, as, as you know, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, a flurry of activity around town hall meetings regarding health care. But you know, these town hall meetings, um, you can bring up ag issues too. And we would hope that if there's a town hall meeting uh, in your locale that you would, uh, not only would you go, but you would take some friends with you, um, you know, Members of Congress, listen to folks, and if they're not hearing from you, uh, it isn't important to them. Uh, so it, we don't want to be in a position here as lobbyists to go to the Hill and to advocate on your behalf and have a member of Congress turn to you and say, well, you can say that, but I'm not hearing anything like that back home in the district or back home in the state. So, uh, you know, we can only be as effective as, as your grassroots activity uh, makes us so uh, take any and every opportunity you can to to participate in town hall meetings send cards send letters make phone calls stop by the district office stop by the state office for your your members of congress uh, those folks uh, are paid to to listen to what's going on back home in those states and those districts so uh, don't miss any opportunities yeah um Kelly, I'll, I'll, let me go ahead and try to answer the question first or, or do closing comments. We only need uh, Go ahead and answer the question. That'd be fine, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Well, John, I've heard about this, about speculation, you know, realize the complexity of the trade agreements that he'll revisit TPP. Yeah, we, we keep hearing a little bit of that. Uh, I, I'll just tell you our experience here when we have talked, you know, both with folks uh, when they were involved in the transition, uh, folks with, you know, Trump's ag advisors, uh, even uh, back channeling into uh, uh, Robert Lighthizer, uh, you know, when we talk to them about the importance of ag and, and trade, uh, the importance of trade for ag, they say we get it, we get it, we understand, we know it, you know, you know, not not in a, a very understanding way. They absolutely get this, and we keep talking about there are a lot of good things that were negotiated in TPP, just like I said earlier about the Mexican and Canadian elements that are in TPP. Um, I would say, you know, TPP is, uh, you know, certainly on, you know, in, in the emergency room right now uh, is possible, could re resuscitate it. I always say anything's possible after, you know, working in this town for quite a while, anything's possible. Uh, that, But I think the more probable thing that you'll look at is some of the elements that were negotiated within TPP and, and possibly picking which countries we might want to advance uh, bilaterals with and taking the elements from a negotiated TPP as a really good starting point. Like for, for your interests uh, in particular, I would say Japan and, and Vietnam, uh, and in addition to Mexico and, and Canada. You, we keep hearing about that. TPP is not absolutely dead. Uh, it's definitely on life support, but um, you'll hear that talk uh, going forward. Now, I'll just segue Kelly into my closing comments. And you know, I certainly endorse what John said, You know, get involved. Um, stay involved, stay, keep educated. I think this webinar is a really great and really innovative idea to talk about this. Um, but realize the fact, you, you know, we, we got some good folks here in Washington uh, uh, working for you really hard on this issue, hour by hour, day by day. Uh, National Corn Growers, U.S. Grains Council, uh, that and complement nicely with, uh, you know, the, the folks that work for you around the world that are going to keep informing you of what's going on so that you can engage at the best possible way in the best possible degree with the best possible information. So 
Um, let's keep on top of this. Uh, again, it is early in the administration. Things are, you know, seem like they're starting to sort out a little bit. Uh, when we talk about trade and agriculture, we get positive responses, but you have to stay involved and you have to pay attention. Um, and, and it's a very critical time. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you, John, both for taking time and Leslie for joining us this morning. Just a few things from our end. Uh, one is, as we look ahead, March 20th is Ag Week, and there will be a number of opportunities to expand upon the necessity, the importance of trade as our governor, Governor Ricketts, travels across the state, does numerous events. We'll highlight that in our weekly update out to the board of directors, and we'll continue to get that information out as it's presented to us. Secondly, we are talking internally uh, about a monthly policy update. Uh, one, it will look back at what happens, uh, what has happened over the last 30 days. More importantly, we are going to include opportunities where you can engage in town halls with your congressional delegation, maybe even uh, at a state level with our senators as they hold town hall meetings across the state. Continue to get opportunities to engage with them, not only on trade, but issues of importance as we look ahead to Farm Bill, as we look ahead uh, at uh, wrapping up this 90 day session here in the state. Those issues of importance and relating those opportunities and, and your, your voice to our state senators, to our national and federal delegation will continue to be important. And we want to highlight those opportunities for you all to get into. Again, thank you. I uh, appreciate everybody taking the time this morning. We wanted to keep it to an hour. We are recording this, and so we will have it available uh, as soon as we can get that uh, finalized and put out on social media and along with our websites. I uh, hope you all have a safe spring as we get into it. I think we'll have a little bit of a bump with some potential snow and, and winter weather coming back over the weekend, but uh, we greatly appreciate you taking time. Have a safe spring, and we'll talk to you later. Don't be afraid to call in the office if questions or issues arise. Thank you.